In today's episode, we're going over an evidence-based guide to patellofemoral pain syndrome assessment and treatment. Let's do it. Welcome to the Fitness Pain-Free Show, where I help physical therapists learn how to get their clients out of pain and back to training in the gym. My name is Dan Pope, and I'll be your instructor. I'm a physical therapist, coach, and fellow meathead. I love training just as much as you do and want to help you get all of your patients out of pain and back to the gym where they belong. First and foremost, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your support. You allow me to do what I love for a living. My name is Dan Pope. I am a physical therapist, coach, personal trainer, and meathead. This is a fitness pain-free show where we help coaches and physical therapists like yourself get your patients out of pain and back to training. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that like button, comment, and subscribe to the channel. If you're listening via podcast, please leave me a positive rating or review. It helps me incredibly. If you want to go the extra step and really support me, consider subscribing to Fitness Pain-Free Insiders. It's a comprehensive educational resource and toolkit for the fitness and rehab professional. Think Netflix, but for trainers and physical therapists. It's premium content from me. It's been updated monthly for the past five plus years. It's an absolute no-brainer for $1. So if you're looking for that next step in terms of improving your education for me, this is where to do it. It's got a private Facebook group, so you can contact me. You can decide upcoming podcast topics. Um, and yeah, you can get started for $1 for a week-long trial. After that, it's just $12.99 per month. You can cancel any time that you want to. You're not going to hurt my feelings, uh, but I really appreciate it if you consider it. So if you want to sign up, head to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, click on Fitness Pain-Free Insiders Online Library to get started. And there'll also be a link in the show notes. So before we get started, I've actually made an evidence-based guide to patellofemoral pain syndrome cheat sheet. So the link will be in the bio. <clears throat> Once you download it, you'll be able to follow along with this webinar, get all the key points, and you have easily digestible information, and you don't have to listen to me drone on over the course of time, all right? So I'll leave that in the show notes and go ahead and check that out where you can follow along and get all the key points. So what exactly is patellofemoral pain syndrome? Well, it's commonly known as anterior knee pain or runner's knee, and it's defined as pain around or behind the patella, which is aggravated by at least one activity that loads the patellofemoral joint during weight bearing on a flexed or bent knee. So basically that could be any sort of squatting, maybe it's stairs, jogging, running, hopping, and jumping. Anytime you're bearing weight on one or both legs and you're bending the knee, it puts stress through the patellofemoral joint. If you have some sort of irritation within that joint, then it can provoke some of your pain, patellofemoral pain, right? So let's go over some relevant anatomy in the patellofemoral joint. So oftentimes the patellofemoral joint is described as a train on train tracks. So I have my knee joint model right here. If you're listening to podcast version of this, I apologize. Basically I'm holding onto the femur, which is the thigh bone. Towards the end of the thigh bone, you have the patellofemoral joint. I have my finger on the patella right here, right? So where the patella sits, is on top of this groove, often referred to as the track, right? And the train is going to the patella. And as I bend my knee, the patella slides along this groove called the tro uh, excuse me, trochlear groove, right? And that's the patellofemoral joint. And if you're looking at an x-ray of the knee from above, they call this the sunrise view, you can see the femur is going to be right below the kneecap or the patella, there's a little space right underneath the patella, and that's the patellofemoral joint. So surrounding the patellofemoral joint, you have some passive structures to help to stabilize it. Now, passive just means that it's not a muscle, so it doesn't actively contract. And those passive structures are going to be the bony alignment of the patella and trochlear groove. So if you have a more shallow groove, that's going to increase the risk of patellar subluxation and potential patellofemoral pain. You have the patellar tendon, you have the joint capsule that surrounds the joint, you have the medial or inside menisco patellar ligament, you have the medial retinaculum, you have the medial patellofemoral ligament, which is a very important stabilizer on the inside of the joint, you have the lateral patellofemoral ligament, the IT band, as well as the lateral retinaculum. 
the active stabilizers of the patellofemoral joint are going to be the quadriceps. And a lot of research have, has focused in the past on the VMO or the inside quad muscle, just because in folks that have patellofemoral pain, there's the thought that there's a lateralization of stress. So the stress is going towards the outside of the joint because we have poor control of the quad musculature on the inside, right? Over the course of time, we've just grown to realize the entire quad is really important and not just the VMO, right? Other structures to stabilize the joint are the pes anserine muscle group. That's going to be the semitendinosus, gracilis, and sartorius, as well as the biceps femoris, which is going to be part of the hamstrings. On top of that, you have the trunk, hip, foot, and ankle. So the joints above and below the knee also are going to exert some control on the joint. And I have a really in-depth biomechanical analysis of how these areas affect the knee joint uh, in my guide, the complete guide to patellofemoral pain. And that's going to be a, a link in the show notes. You guys can check that out. Uh, I'm not going to go crazy in depth on that now. So when people have patellofemoral pain syndrome, what is the pain source, right? All patients want to know what's actually causing my pain. And here's the thing. We, we don't actually truly know what's going to be the pain generator in folks that have patellofemoral pain. And uh, there's also a chance that there's several different types of structures within the knee that could create pain. So it's not like everyone that has patellofemoral pain has irritation of a specific section. It could be different for every person that has patellofemoral pain. So the areas we believe could be sources of pain uh, are the infrapatellar fat pad. A uh, decent amount of research on this, uh, especially from Scott Dye. However, this is debated in other articles and other authors don't believe the fat pad is a contributor to patellofemoral pain. You could have some, some irritation to the synovial plicae. You could have some irritation to the retinaculae on the inside or outside of the joint. Maybe the joint capsule gets irritated. Maybe the patellofemoral ligaments, uh, the medial patellofemoral ligament in particular, is one of the uh, structures we believe gets irritated in patellofemoral pain. And we could also have irritation to the subchondral bone, which is basically the bone beneath the cartilage. Uh, what's interesting about the patellofemoral joint has a lot of cartilage. And this is good because this joint takes a lot of stress with human beings with regular activities. And the thing about cartilage is that it doesn't have no susception or it doesn't produce a bunch of pain. So as you take stress to the cartilage, the cartilage itself is not providing no susception. All right. So we don't think it's a pain generator. It's one of the reasons why you can have quite a bit of wear in the cartilage and not realize this is actually going on. However, the bone beneath the cartilage is actually pretty rich in nociception. So there's a thought that the subchondral bone is potentially what's creating pain with patellofemoral pain. What is the prevalence of patellofemoral pain syndrome? Well, it's common. It's actually the most common knee condition treated in all outpatient clinics. And as a physical therapist, I can say, yeah, I think that's true, right? Uh, patellofemoral pain syndrome consists of 25% of all knee disorders in the orthopedic setting. So again, that's going to be more common than any other knee problem, right? And it's very common as um, an orthopedic issue if you compare it to all types of pain problems, right? It's very common in runners, tennis, and military. 3.8% of males and 6.5% of females get it annually, which is a huge chunk of human beings, right? And it's seen more commonly in young adults and also occurs during periods of rapid growth. So typically you see this in adolescence. What is the clinical presentation of patellofemoral pain? Well, it occurs mainly in young adults, like I said, especially during periods of rapid growth. It usually presents as a gradual onset of anterior knee pain, so what's important about this is that it is a gradual onset. So when we're talking about differential diagnosis, if something came up slowly over the course of time, it's less likely to be, let's say, a traumatic meniscus tear, right, or a ligamentous injury, and more likely to be patellofemoral pain. Pain is usually present around or underneath the kneecap. It is a recalcitrant condition that can persist for many years without intervention. In other words, this condition tends not to get better with rest and can stay painful for long periods of time. More on this later. It generally hurts with movements and increased stress in the patellofemoral joint. No brainer, right? So things like squatting, stair climbing, hiking, running, and prolonged sitting can aggravate patellofemoral pain. 
75% of patients with patellofemoral pain syndrome present with tenderness along the patella. So if you poke around the kneecap on the outside of the kneecap, you're probably going to find a little irritation in these folks. You have tenderness on the facet palpation, and sometimes you'll see some small joint effusion, although there really isn't much. Okay, Usually joint effusion is a sign of more tibiofemoral joint pathology, like a meniscus injury or a cartilage injury, not necessarily patellofemoral pain. There's often pain on sitting or rising from a seated position. Also some pain straightening the knee following sitting. So if I've been sitting for a long period of time and then I straighten out my knee, oh, it's a little irritated in that area. Okay. What is the natural history of patellofemoral pain syndrome? So patellofemoral pain is very interesting to me because it tends not to be self-limiting. And what this means is that in a lot of conditions, so radicular low back pain is a good example. So if you have some sort of nerve injury, nerve root injury in the spine, if you do nothing, right, over the course of time, it tends to get better. And they describe this as a self-limiting condition. So basically, because the area is painful, you probably don't do too much to aggravate it. So the body is naturally protecting you from doing too much by providing pain. This allows the area to heal over the course of time, right? This isn't really the case with patellofemoral pain for some reason, right? So after the initial insult, so after you develop knee pain, this pain can be prolonged indefinitely, if not intervened upon, right? So it never resolves. Uh, oftentimes in physical therapy, we talk about some sort of pathology regressing to the mean. So over the course of time, your knee pain just gets better because of time, right? Uh, not always the case with patellofemoral pain, right? So a common story I hear from folks that have patellofemoral pain is that they believe they have like a bum knee, right? So basically they hurt their knee at one point and it just never went away. So their knee is just bad at this point, which obviously isn't true. We can intervene and we can actually make this better. But here's the other piece. Uh, it tends to be a, a pretty tough to treat. Um, that's that term recalcitrant. So with exercise therapy, so some sort of physical therapy, around 60% of people, and this goes for adolescents and adults, continue to have pain 12 months following the onset of exercise therapy. Okay. And that stinks. No one likes to hear that, that um, statistic. But basically, if you have someone that has patellofemoral pain and you give them a program to try to get them out of pain that consists of some sort of exercise, over the course of time, a big chunk of those are still going to be painful. So that kind of stinks. It's it's challenging to treat, we'll say. What are the risk factors for the development of patella, patellofemoral pain syndrome? And first and foremost, I want to talk about what does not predict future patellofemoral pain syndrome, because there's a lot of misinformation out there right now about knee pain in general. I want to myth, a myth bust here. We want to get rid of those ideas, right? So there is strong to moderate evidence to indicate that age, height, weight, body mass index, or BMI, body fat, and Q angle were not risk factors for future patellofemoral pain. So Q angle does not relate to patellofemoral pain, okay? First and foremost, it's important. We also have moderate evidence to indicate that hip weakness is not a risk factor for future patellofemoral pain syndrome. So I'll say this again, because I hear this so often in the social media world, that having a weak hip is a reason why you go on to develop knee pain, specifically patellofemoral pain. Here's the thing. Hip weakness is not a risk factor for your future patellofemoral pain, okay? And that's important to understand. We actually have a bit of research that is going to say the opposite of this. We'll talk about that in a second. So what does predict future patellofemoral pain? We have moderate evidence to indicate that quadricep weakness is a risk factor for future patellofemoral pain in the military. And this is especially true when you normalize this for BMI, okay? So if you have a weak quad compared to your body weight, that's a sign you may develop patella, excuse me, patellofemoral pain in the future, right? And here's another really cool stat. In adolescents, having increased hip abduction strength, so if you have a stronger hip, if you have stronger hip abduction strength, that becomes a risk factor for future patellofemoral pain, okay? So we just discussed that hip weakness does not lead to patellofemoral pain. Well, we have a study in adolescence that if you have a really strong hip, so if you have really good hip abduction strength, 
that is a risk factor future for future patellofemoral pain. Okay. So I have no idea why this is. My best guess is that if you have a big, strong joint like the hip, and let's say you have a weak knee, then when you jump and land, you're going to move more through the joint that has the strength and control. Okay. If you have a really weak quad and a lot of knee pain, when you jump and land on that side that has knee pain, you're not going to land in a full pistol squat, right? That's going to kill your knee and you don't have the strength to control that. So why on earth would you jump and land and move more through the hip joint if it's weak, right? Or painful. You just won't. The body doesn't have the control. So if you have a lot of strength and control of the hip joint, maybe when we jump and land, we end up getting more valgus and controlling more of our jumping and landing mechanics via the hips, which may put some stress on the knee. Again, this is just a guess on my part. I really don't know. And it's important you understand that this is just a guess. But do keep in mind that having stronger hips is a risk factor for developing knee pain or patellofemoral pain. So what's the mechanism of injury for patellofemoral pain syndrome? Okay. So I want you guys to understand that these are my own theories based on what the literature is showing in sports injuries, right? Largely, patellofemoral pain syndrome is described as an overuse syndrome, okay? And there's this idea of an envelope of function. This was developed by a guy by the name of Scott Dye, who is a pioneer in the patellofemoral world. And he described this idea of an envelope of function. So basically, your knee has a certain capacity. And if you're training or whatever you're doing on a regular basis, it exceeds the capacity of the knee joint, this could lead to patellofemoral pain, okay? And this fits really nicely into this idea of overuse, okay? So if you have too much total training volume, let's say if you're squatting 13 times per week, all right, it might just be too darn much. And that's the reason why you get patellofemoral pain, right? We exceed the body's capacity to handle the stress and it breaks down. Okay. The other piece could lead to injury is a spike in training volume. So let's say you're used to squatting one or two times a week, and all of a sudden you decide to squat four times a week. Your body is simply not used to it, and you're likely to develop some patellofemoral pain. Okay. Some other factors that may affect overuse are your ability to recover. All right. So if you're not recovering well from your training, which is going to be having good sleep, good nutrition, and also having minimal stress. It may increase your likelihood of getting hurt. We also know psychological profiles can relate to injury. So if I am a person who has perfectionistic tendencies, okay, that could increase my likelihood of getting an injury. If I would have had a prior injury in my knee, so if I've had patellofemoral pain in the past, I'm more likely to get in the future. And lastly, if, if I've had a lesser injury, okay, so if my knee was a little irritated and I decided to push through that pain, it's likely that I may develop more pain in the future, right? So here's the thing. I'm not going to go in depth on these potential mechanisms. Again, these are theoretical. Uh, there's a lot of research I do cite that will point towards these being some reasons why you may get hurt, especially in the gym. However, I actually have an entire mini course that's going to help, help you understand all these true mechanisms of injury. And one of the lectures in the mini course is called Seven Reasons Why Athletes Get Hurt in the Gym and What to Do About It. I'll leave a link in the show notes so you can definitely check that out if you'd like to learn more. So another mechanism of injury you'll find in our medical literature is going to be some biomechanical issues related to patellofemoral pain. So the biggest one is going to be dynamic valgus, or basically knee in when you squat. Okay, so if I go into the bottom of the squat and I'm coming out of the hole and my knee comes in, that's called dynamic valgus. So when I'm getting knee in, what's happening is that my femur is moving medially, okay? And the kneecap is going to either be staying in place or moving laterally. And what happens is that we get forces more towards the outside or lateral side of the joint, okay? So we're not evenly disappor dissipating forces within the patellofemoral joint as much as if we had the knee over top of the toe and we weren't valgus, okay? And this can occur during squats, lunges, Olympic lifts, single leg jumps, and landings. So if I'm getting a lot of valgus during my tasks, I may be getting a lot of uh, increased stress towards the lateral side of the joint. And if I don't have the capacity within the knee to handle those forces, I may end up with a little bit of pain. Okay. Now, 
If you want me to go in depth on the biomechanical reasons for valgus within the body, you can click on the link in the show notes that says complete guide to patellofemoral pain. And I'll just walk you through this A to Z. Okay. There's a ton of information there. Okay. The second biomechanical factor that can lead to uh, patellofemoral pain syndrome is going to be moment arms or quad dominance, uh, as it's often calls, called. So on the far left, I have a picture of someone, it's me, doing a barbell back squat to a box. And I'm really sitting back. And when I sit back really far in a squat, it's going to increase stress on the hips and spine. And it's going to decrease stress on the knee. And this is because I create a really large moment arm for the hip and I make a really small moment arm for the knee. So if I constantly squat with my hips really far back, I'm going to decrease stress on the patellofemoral joint, a little less likely to drive some uh, irritation there just because I'm decreasing the amount of stress there. Keep in mind patellofemoral pain, largely an overuse issue. If I'm not using it that much, then maybe I don't irritate it, okay? On the far right, there's a picture of me doing a goblet squat with a big old heel lift, okay? The difference between this and a box squat is that my knees come really far forward, and you can see that I've created a large moment arm for the knee, the moment arm for the hip got a lot smaller. So now the knee joint, the patellofemoral joint, is going to contribute a lot more in order to, excuse me, the quad muscle is going to contribute a lot more to produce force to get out of the hole of the squat. And because of that, the patellofemoral joint just takes more stress. So here's the thing. This is not a lecture series on biomechanics or exercise prescription for the knee joint. However, I've actually made this entire lecture series, okay? I mean, entire lecture series on exercise prescription and dosage for knee pain. We go over patellofemoral pain. We go over patellar tendinopathy. We go over quad tendinopathy. I go over stressing the tibiofemoral joint for meniscus pathology and cartilage, et cetera, okay? So if you want to learn more about that, I have an entire lecture series. It's inside of Fitness Pain for Insiders. I'll leave a link in the show notes. It's just a dollar for a week trial, Go download it if you want to cancel the subscription right afterwards. You're welcome to, all right? You won't hurt my feelings, okay? But it's suffice to say, I don't want to go in-depth in this lecture series. What is the differential diagnosis for patellofemoral pain syndrome? So patellofemoral pain is a diagnosis of exclusion. And what that means is you want to rule out other pathologies. And once you've ruled everything else out, if you have some sort of anterior knee pain, we can surmise that this is some sort of patellofemoral issue, okay? Now, here's the other thing. You can have patellofemoral injury that's not patellofemoral pain syndrome. So the first one's going to be patellofemoral osteoarthritis. So if I'm over the age of 40 and I have some sort of radiographic evidence of less cartilage within the patellofemoral joint, usually on the lateral side of the joint, okay? If I have a different position of my patella now, just because I've had more wear on the outside of my joint over the course of time, you would diagnose this as patellofemoral osteoarthritis, which might be a little different in the way you treat than patellofemoral pain. You could be also dealing with some sort of cartilage issue within the patellofemoral joint that is traumatic in nature. And usually they tease that out via subjective history. Okay. You could be dealing with some syndic larsen johansson disease, osgood schlatter disease, patellar or quad tendinopathy. And all of these conditions can usually be teased out via palpation and where exactly the pain is, okay? Either superior or inferior to the patella. Usually patellofemoral pain is behind the patella or on the inside or outside of the patellofemoral joint. There could be some sort of trauma. So if I twisted my knee playing soccer, especially if there's a lot of swelling present, you're going to start rolling out uh, patellofemoral pain, okay? You can actually bang your kneecap pretty well and create some patellofemoral pain. That can certainly be a mechanism of injury. Uh, if you hit it hard enough, there's a chance you fracture your patella, so you have to be on the lookout for that. And lastly, you want to try to rule out tibiofemoral joint pathology. I normally do this via assessing joint line tenderness, which is typically a very sensitive test. So if I palpate around the sides of the joint, it's a good chance there is not a meniscus issue I'm dealing with. Usually there's no pain or limitation with end range flexion or extension with patellofemoral pain, especially when you're not weight bearing. So it usually is very limited uh, in flexion if you're weight bearing. So if I ask you to do a pistol squat, you're not going to be able to go very far with the patellofemoral pain. 
But if I passively take you in end range flexion, there shouldn't be a limitation if you're dealing with telofemoral issues. If there is swelling, it should be minimal. If you have a lot of swelling, I'm thinking more ligamentous issues. I'm thinking more meniscus pathology. You should have negative ligamentous testing, and then you should have negative history of trauma, okay? Usually this is an overuse issue, and if there's something traumatic that led to this problem, it's probably not patellofemoral pain. So how do we go about diagnosing patellofemoral pain syndrome? Well, first and foremost, you look at the history. Like I said previously, this is a condition of overuse, right? So folks will typically say, I started some sort of new activity, right? Maybe that's running, maybe that's weight training, something that stresses the patellofemoral joint, and you get some pain, all right? And this could be with a spike in training or maybe just a new activity, potentially. So if all of a sudden you start doing more mileage, okay, or you increase the intensity with your running, maybe you add another day of Olympic weightlifting uh, or squatting into your program. And you'll find that gradually the knee starts hurting and it gets worse over the course of time. Okay. Can this happen kind of all of a sudden? Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. But generally, as a gradual onset, people don't always remember what caused it. Um, and they sometimes have no idea what ended up being the catalyst to create this injury over the course of time, is in they can't recall, okay, it was an increase in running volume or anything like that. Sometimes it's just insidious and they, they have no idea why it occurred. Right. It's usually not traumatic. What additional criteria can kind of help you point to a patellofemoral issue? So if you're hearing crepitus or grinding uh, behind the knee during knee flexion movements, or the patient is telling you they're getting some crepitus or grinding behind the kneecap, that's a sign maybe you're dealing with patellofemoral pain. If the individual says they have pain with sitting or pain rising from a seated position, or if the knee hurts straightening after sitting for a prolonged period, this may roll in some patellofemoral pain. These folks will typically have something called a movie theater sign, not all of them, which is basically when you sit down for a long period of time. So imagine you're watching a movie, which is usually a few hours, right? The knee just starts hurting, okay? And the idea is that if you sit with a flexed knee, your quad and patella down to the patella tendon where it attaches onto your tibia, the tib tuberosity forms a strap that will compress the patellofemoral joint and if you sit in that compressed position for a long period of time, it can create some irritation, right? Or just tell your body, hey, get up and move. The patellofemoral joint doesn't like this, right? That's a movie theater sign. What kind of subjective information might your patient tell you? Well, really, in patellofemoral pain, anything that aggravates the knee joint when you load flexion could be a patellofemoral issue, right? So things like squatting, stairs, jogging, running, hopping, and jumping can all aggravate the patellofemoral joint. In my world, so I work with a lot of Olympic weightlifters, strength and fitness. Squatting typically hurts. The Olympic lifts usually hurt. It usually hurts as you descend deeper into a squat. Sometimes if the patellofemoral joint is irritated enough, things like jerk dips will hurt. Or in a split jerk, the front side leg will get irritated because you're basically in a lunge position when you catch the weight. Lunges and step-ups in general can be pretty irritating. You'll also find that deadlifts feel better than squats if folks have the patellofemoral pain. What about objective measurements? So you're going through your evaluation and you palpate the knee and you notice some tenderness on the facets on the side of the patellofemoral joint. This could be a sign you're dealing with patellofemoral pain. Usually you won't find any effusion, but you might find a little bit around the patella. If there's larger effusion, it indicates something else going on, right? You'll also generally find normal range of motion passively. So if I lay on your back and I fully extend the knee and I fully flex the knee, it should be the same as on the other side. And it shouldn't be painful, okay? How about manual muscle testing? Well, in folks that have patellofemoral pain, they generally have weak hip abduction, extension, and external rotation. Now, keep in mind, this is after you already have patellofemoral pain. For whatever weird reason, folks that have patellofemoral pain didn't normally have hip abduction, extra rotation, and extension weakness prior. This all occurs after you have the injury, okay? The other thing you may find is weakness in knee extension. And oftentimes, this is painful. So anytime you flex the quad, especially with the knee bent, you're going to load the patellofemoral joint. If you've got some irritation behind the kneecap, it might hurt. 
And people with patellofemoral pain syndrome have been shown to have a 6 to 12% deficit in strength compared to healthy controls without patellofemoral pain. Okay, so expect that quad to be a little weak. How about special tests? Do we have any good special tests to help rule in patellofemoral pain? Well, first and foremost, we don't really have a gold standard in order to diagnose patellofemoral pain. So when you do an MRI or an x-ray of the knee, that doesn't help to rule in patellofemoral pain, okay? So we don't really have a gold standard to measure on. So there's no good sensitivity or specificity reporting for any of these tests. But there's a few you can use with your clinical reasoning process if you're having trouble figuring out what's going on. One's a femoral grind test. So the patient lies on their back, relaxes the knee, and then the practitioner, so me, takes their hand and, it, and I'll press directly down towards the table over top of the kneecap, and I'll ask the patient to contract their quad. And you notice painful crepitus, so the patient says, yeah, that reproduces my same knee pain, then that's a sign that you're dealing with some patellofemoral pain. All I'm doing is engaging the patella into the trochlear groove and grinding that joint. Okay. If it hurts, the sign that maybe the patellofemoral joint is irritated. Okay. Palpation is also helpful in folks with patellofemoral pain. So if they have a little tenderness around the kneecap, that's a sign they might have some patellofemoral issues. Just keep in mind if you're having tenderness above or below the kneecap, that's a sign you might have some quad tendinopathy, maybe some patellar tendinopathy, and not necessarily patellofemoral pain. Okay. If you notice excessive patellar gliding. So if there's a ton of joint play, that's a sign, excuse me, in the patellofemoral joint, that's a sign that this individual may have some patellar or trochlear groove morpho morphology that's going to predispose them to instability within that joint, which may create some more pain. Okay. And again, this is a diagnosis of exclusion. So for these folks, you want to make sure you do a really good job of differential diagnosis. Is there a lot of swelling? How's your range of motion? Is there any joint line tenderness? Have you gone through some of your ligamentous tests? Have you gone through meniscus testing? Are they all negative? If they are, good sign there's patellofemoral pain. Do we need imaging for patellofemoral pain? Generally not. So we usually don't learn much by getting an MRI or an x-ray. Uh, it may be indicated if someone is not progressing. We can figure out maybe what's going on a little bit further. But generally speaking, this is not a condition where you need imaging. Another thing to keep in mind is that we've done quite a bit of research recently about psychosocial factors in folks that have patellofemoral pain. So in folks that have patellofemoral pain, especially severe cases, you'll find kinesiophobia. So these folks tend to be fearful of movement. They can also have some anxiety, depression, and maybe some catastrophizing. So believing that their knee pain will never get better or they have this bum knee, like I said earlier, right? So it's important that we educate folks on the prognosis of patellofemoral pain and that they can get better over the course of time. Now, do these issues, these social psychosocial factors correlate with the onset of pain? So we've got some research, at least in the low back, that things like depression actually do correlate strongly with a new onset of pain. We don't know this yet for patella, excuse me, patellofemoral pain. So it could just be that you get patellofemoral pain and then these things occur afterwards. That makes perfect sense. If your knee is killing you, you might be depressed about it, right? You might be scared to move because anytime you move, it hurts like heck, right? Or it could actually be that these uh, beliefs will lead to patellofemoral pain. But that's yet to be seen. Uh, needless to say, it's probably important that as, in part of your treatment, at least, you give these guys some hope, let them know it's okay to move and give some guidance on how to move so you can reduce some of these psychosocial factors that might be keeping them in pain, right? And keep them from making the right decisions from a rehab standpoint. Evidence-based treatment of patellofemoral pain. So how do we actually treat these patients with patellofemoral pain? Uh, these treatments are coming from a study, Winter et al. in 2020. I'll leave that link in the show notes if you want to check it out. So what they were looking at was all treatments found to be more effective than wait and see. So wait and see is basically, we've diagnosed you with patellofemoral pain. Now we're going to let you go and do whatever the heck you want to do. And we're not going to intervene whatsoever. Okay. Now, this actually works fairly well in some pathologies. I think lumbar radiculopathy is one of those ones, right? Radicular pain in the low back. Uh, however, that's not necessarily the case with patellofemoral pain. As I said earlier, having patellofemoral pain is one of those things that can be recalcitrant and not get better with time, okay? So in this study, what did they find was helpful 
for treatment of the patellofemoral pain? What was helpful beyond wait and see? Well, the first one was education, okay? And with ed education, uh, generally speaking, it was a 30-minute education session, and they went over a few different topics. So they went over why your knee is hurting, so some basic anatomy, not really in-depth. If you guys want to see the exact pamphlet they gave to patients, I'll put a link in the show notes so you can check it out, right? It's going to be in the guide to patellofemoral pain. They also gave some information about pain management. They talked about how to modify physical activity using pacing and load management, excuse me, load management strategies, and also information on optimal knee alignment during daily tasks. So basically avoiding knee valgus, right? That was the education group found to be more effective than wait and see. Also effective exercise therapy. We know this. Generally speaking, exercises targeted towards the knee, hip, foot, and trunk are helpful. Blood flow restriction training is helpful for knee pain. Aerobic exercise is helpful for patellofemoral pain. And in all of these studies, they basically use a combination of different types of exercise therapy. Okay. Generally speaking, most of these studies combine hip and knee strengthening. And this is because we probably because we have some research to show that if you combine knee strength training with hip strength training, you have superior results uh, compared to doing just hip strengthening or just knee strengthening. Okay. In a lot of these studies, it was piecemeal, right? So they may have done uh, knee strengthening, hip strengthening, and BFR. They may have done knee strengthening, hip strengthening, and foot strengthening, right? So uh, again, this was a big study. They combined a lot of research and they were just looking at what was helpful. And a lot of things were helpful, okay? Another thing found to be more helpful than a wait and see approach was using a foot orthosis, right? And these were prefabricated orthosis. They weren't doing any custom molding of people's foot. They were just giving them something off the shelves. And they also combined the foot orthosis treatment with education. So the same things we just talked about previously. And this was actually more helpful for folks than a wait and see approach. Okay. Even though this wasn't a particularly active form of treatment, right? We gave people some education and gave them a foot orthosis. It was still helpful. Okay. What else is helpful? patellar taping and mobilization. Okay. So a lot of folks will be surprised to hear that maybe some manual therapies or more passive treatments like patellar taping can be helpful. And from what I've read in the past, these treatments tend to be more short-term in nature, not necessarily the best treatment for the long-term, but if you combine taping and mobilization with exercise, orthotics, and or education, you actually do get a pretty good long-term effect, right? And again, in this study, they were looking at a lot of different studies and combining them and trying to figure out what was most helpful from a treatment perspective. So these studies use a combination of everything. It was piecemeal, right? Some included some orthosis with education. Some was patellar mobilization and taping with exercise. Some was just exercise. So it was a smorgasbord, really, okay? But all of these things were helpful and effective. So here's the thing. We know all of these things were better than wait and see, what was best? What was the most superior treatment? Okay. So here's what was kind of cool. <laughs> All treatments had similar outcomes at 12 months compared to wait and see. Okay. So if you give someone a foot orthosis with some education, you have the same outcome at one year compared to giving them a bunch of hip and knee strengthening exercises. Okay. So the more passive treatment of giving an orthosis with some education performed at the same level as exercise, okay? I think that's important to understand because we often think that exercise is always superior, at least in this study, it doesn't seem that way, okay? However, if you look at the results at three months, um, exercise and education seem to be superior than the other treatment groups, okay? And there's a lot of strategies to choose from. Like I said before, these studies were kind of a smorgasbord of exercises. So as long as you're doing some hip and knee strengthening. You can probably plug in some foot strengthening, maybe some core strengthening, whatever else, and you'll see a pretty good improvement in pain um, better at three months than the other treatment groups. Okay. So that's what's helpful about the active group. It tends to give better short-term effects. All right. And the last piece was that wait and see was not helpful. All right. Uh, so in some conditions, maybe we can let people have pain for a longer period of time. Generally, it tends to get better. We can tell them it tends to get better. At least with patellofemoral pain, it doesn't seem to be the case, all right? So if you're diagnosing someone with patellofemoral pain, 
they're probably not going to regress to the mean and get better over the course of time. So the wait and see approach, not recommended for these folks. We probably should intervene. Okay. Makes sense to me. And guys, I know I didn't go over the specifics for treatment of the patellofemoral joint, but I have a complete guide to patellofemoral pain syndrome, and I'll go over 100% how I like to treat this common condition. It's a step-by-step -step guide with all my favorite exercises, when to incorporate them, and how to advance them over the course of time. I'll put the link in the show notes. Definitely check that out if you want to see how I do it. I have a billion references, and I know you can't even see this if you're watching YouTube because the font is so tiny. I'm going to have all of these references in the show notes. So if you want to check those out and see where I got this information from, definitely do that. And lastly, I just want to give you a big thank you for your support. You do truly allow me to do what I love for a living. Believe it or not, I enjoy hanging out in my office right here and talking and presenting and hopefully helping other clinicians and coaches. If you're watching this on YouTube, please give me a thumbs up. I'd love to hear comments on how you think I treat patellofemoral pain. Do you think that this was helpful? Do you not? Do you want to see me go in a different direction in the future? Do you hate me generally? I'd love to hear it. Okay. And please subscribe. If you're listening to this via podcast, leave me a positive rating and review. It helps me a ton, helps me grow, helps me continue to create these in the future. Okay. And lastly, if you want to go that last extra step to support me, Head to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs, and sign up for Fitness Pain Free Insider's online library. I'll put a link in the show notes. It's just a freaking dollar, okay, and then $12.99 a month in the future. If you subscribe, it allows me to continue doing this in the future, right? It takes a lot of time and effort to put these together. Uh, so if I can get some support, that helps me continue, right? Well, thank you very much, guys. Again, I appreciate it. Thanks again, and I'll see you on the next one.